I am Chris Benton. I'm a professor of architecture at UC Berkeley. I teach building science, basically how buildings work. We could probably cut this energy use to a third of what it currently is, still have adequate ventilation. You look at lighting and heating and air conditioning and all sorts of systems. I enjoy explaining how things work. Throw the air to the periphery and then into the next room. Years ago, I was spending a lot of time shooting photographs, but in support of lectures like you see Berkeley. I loved it as a tool, but it, it was not so much a creative outlet. And then I discovered something new. Kite aerial photography. Using kites to lift cameras to take aerial photographs. As architects were trained to try to see a larger picture, there's this bird's eye view in architecture to show how things fit together and then hear from these photographs. Wow, you know, here's a bird's eye view of the immediate world around me. It's a low cost, pretty accessible technique. It's actually pretty fun to do and yields really interesting images. There's a big piece about this that's understanding kites and learning how to fly them. You try to get kites that are stable. So when I go out in the field, I typically carry four or five kites. Now this is a little tiny kite. It's a small eight square foot kite. It's air inflated, so the air blows it up. And it's tough, it's like a alley cat. You, you sort of can handle winds that are 25 miles an hour and it just sort of gets in there. And... But when the winds get really light, you need to use a framed kite. Uh, and this is a kite that doesn't inflate itself with the air, but rather has sticks to lend its shape. I built this one, uh, and it's made of very lightweight materials. The framing is made out of carbon fiber reinforced rods, and they're only the diameter of a pencil. They're super light. And so it's a kite that works really well when the winds are low and, and deforms horribly if the winds get too high. So it has its own little wind range. The idea is you look at what the wind's doing around you, and you try to pick a kite that matches the wind. For the first 10 minutes, you're looking at the kite, and it tells you a lot about what the wind's like and about whether it's going to be stable, about whether you would like to trust your camera to it. Uh, don't go there. I always think of it as having a conversation with the kite. Don't go there either. Come on, ah. You want it to be stable and provide enough lift to lift whatever camera you're using, but not so much lift that you have to fight it. then you have to have some way to sort of isolate the camera from the kite line itself to reduce vibration. And then you also want something to level the camera relative to the horizon. I'm using for that a suspension called the Picove suspension. And the mass of the camera causes this cross with its pulleys to go level to the horizon. These arms are harvested out of an old hard drive from an IBM AT. This is an old model aircraft radio that had two thumbsticks, which is not a very good geometry for me. So I took all the circuit boards out and then ran it through a bandsaw, cut the extra sort of volume off, put the circuit boards back in and made new finishing pieces. And that means I can, if I'm walking around, I can fly the kite in one hand and I control all the camera functions with a one-handed controller. This wheel turns it through the compass, 360 degrees. Uh, the stick will tilt it this switch does portrait to landscape, and then I have a button which presses the shutter. One of the differences between the kite photography and airplane or helicopter photography is it's, it occurs a lot between that region just immediately above our heads and maybe up to around 200 feet. And it's very difficult to occupy that space with a helicopter or with an airplane. This sort of lower level view that no one's much explored. There are not many techniques that'll put you there. With the kite, you can hang a camera there and sort of hover. You're close, you can see detail. The strength of shadows in a particular composition or the texture of the ground, it's intimate. One of the neat things about kite photography has been you have to invent your own gear. So I'm always tinkering around on the workbench, building apparatus. How can I achieve getting a camera in the air and pointing in the right direction and sufficiently stable to, to capture a useful image. I love to build things. I'm a tinkerer by nature. I think I get a lot of that from my grandfather. 
I learned that it was, um, it was okay to go try to do things that you didn't exactly know how to do. I've got my complete history of kite aerial photography rigs in this one drawer. This is my first rig built around the Yashica T4, very capable point and shoot 35 millimeter camera. It had two axes, it could rotate and tilt. It took about 100 rolls of film with that. And then this is a rig that's designed around rubber bands and silly putty. So there's a little brass tube into which is stuffed silly putty. And then another tube is stuffed into the silly putty. I take a rubber band and tie it down or sort of loop it around that pin. And that pin will move around ever so slowly. It's basically the rubber bands waging war against the silly putty, but the silly putty ultimately loses. And when this pin rotates all the way around to facing upward, might take two minutes, then the rubber band will slip off. This lever goes up and another rubber band pulls that lever down toward the camera where there's a little nubbin that pushes the shutter button. When the rubber band goes relaxed, the shutter is actuated, but it also drops this ping pong ball as a visual indicator that the image has been taken. But my go-to rig, the one I use the most, is now a digital single lens reflex. This is back up around three pounds again, so it's pretty heavy, uh, but it takes really fine photographs, good exposure, good resolution, nice smooth sensor. Again, three axes, rotates, tilts, and then landscape to portrait. One of the interesting things about kite photography is it's sort of, I'm in, in a chain of succession and a history that began over 100 years ago. Back in a golden age of photography, people were very eager to get cameras in the air. We're strapping them to balloons and, and pigeons and rockets and kites. That's a really famous photograph by George Lawrence, panorama of San Francisco after the earthquake, 1906. He was flying a swing lens panoramic camera that weighed 50 pounds and exposed a negative that was 18 inches by 55 inches wide. There was a lot of experimentation in kite photography at that stage. And so there were these sort of giants, these really interesting people that invented the first technique. And, and they did things that we still emulate today. We're out here in the, in the middle of South San Francisco Bay. The salt ponds are places that were once marsh, and they've been diked to cause the water to evaporate off. It makes a stunningly visual landscape. If you stand out here next to the salt ponds and look at them from a, a sort of a, a normal point of view, you see a lot of sky reflection. But as I take these photographs and look downward, you look straight down through the water and you can see the wonderful colors. When everybody asks, oh, can you see what the camera's seeing? You can send video down, but I don't use an electronic viewfinder. I'm on the ground watching this kite. I know basically what the lens is. And I've thought ahead of time of the type of image I'd like to capture in that location. So then it becomes a process of trying to line these shots up by watching the camera. Sometimes you can really think through it and you get what you thought. But more often than not, things are revealed that you didn't anticipate. And you're not totally um, in control is probably the, the, the most seductive part for me. Just by displacing ourselves, then we get an entirely new perspective on things that are familiar. And it reveals a lot. Kites have been used since ancient times to get a bird's eye view of the world below or attack your enemies from above. Legend tells of a father who strapped his son to a kite to escape exile on a remote island. A fine strategy, unless you're afraid of heights. In the late 1800s, a flamboyant maker named Samuel Franklin Cody hooked several kites together. These kite trains were more stable and could carry more weight. Cody's giant batwing kite train took a passenger in a gondola over a thousand feet up. The tradition continues today with artists like Patrick de Kooning who launches giant kites carrying dancers into the sky.
Major funding for Make is provided by Geek Squad.